Yo, come on in. <laughs> I'm slapping like it came. Come on. This is, I'm sorry, I don't own the right to this music. This is the Potter's House of Denver. The best days of your life. Come on in and enjoy. All right. Hey, hey, brother LT, pastor, how are you, sir? Hey, auntie, how are you? God bless you all for coming in. Hey, X-Man, what's happening? Good to see you, sir. Hey, preacher, I see you. Minister Gina, Sister Arnetta. Lady Sergeant, I see you. Happy Wednesday. I know that's right. Yes, Lord, it's happy Wednesday. <laughs> Minister Georgia Price. Bless your heart. Where's JP? Hey, Sister Hubbard. Good to see you. Elder Kevin. All right, all right. Listen, this is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad. Brother Thomas, bless you, sir. All right, God bless you all. Good to see all you all here tonight. Glory to God. Y'all forgive me for logging on uh, a few minutes late. I must confess, I was watching something uh, and it really caught my attention. But I needed every bit of that. Have you ever had one of those days where you were uh, kind of uh, uh, subdued from the day before? <laughs> Glory to God. And so I was kind of uh, distract, distracted a little bit. And I looked up and said, dear God, it's time to go on right now. And so anyway, bless God that we're here. Thank God to see all of you all that are coming online. I'll wait, I'll wait a few moments for some of you all. Hey, dig in part, I'll see you. Deacon JP is watching. I see you, sir. And again, God bless all of you all and bless God for you all being a part of our Bible Institute on tonight. As always, I pray that tonight something is said that is going to bless your life for the better. Let's pray. Let's dive into the word tonight. All right. Father, thank you again tonight for this chance to be in your word. God, as always, we look at you to strengthen us tonight. God, give us your strength. Give us uh, what to say tonight. We thank you. God, open up the, our ears to hear and our hearts to receive. We bless you and give you glory. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen, amen, <clears throat> and amen. All right. Hey there, my mother. I see you. Thank God you are here. All right. Let's go right, right to the word. Uh, St. Mark, the fourth chapter. St. Mark's Gospel, the fourth chapter. This has been our foundational text for the last few weeks. If you are keeping up, this is week. Uh, this is our sixth lesson. So, Baba Jean Robinson, bless you. Hey, Brother Mike. This is our sixth lesson uh, as we deal with navigating through the rough seasons. Uh, Book of Mark, the fourth chapter. Look at verse 34. It says, "And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow." And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. All right, Sister Lillian, bless your heart. Good to see you. Tonight, again, once we go back into our lesson, dealing with uh, navigating through rough seasons. But tonight, I want to approach this lesson tonight. Uh, approach it with this thought, the dangers of navigating through rough seasons without God. All right? Navigating through rough seasons without God. And I think tonight this is going to be vital, <clears throat> excuse me, for our lives because uh, I'm surprised at the number of believers who try to 
uh, navigate through rough roads or even through good times without God. And that's a danger, hear me, that is dangerous when you and I try to navigate through rough seasons without God. The other day I was talking to mother and uh, we were discussing all the gun violence and the killings and just some of the crazy things that's happening in our world. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, 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 in the made the uprisings in Chicago. And she made a statement that caused me to think. She said, uh, and I quote, she said, if all this is going on and the saints are praying, what would it be like if the saints were not praying? And that's a vital question <clears throat> because oftentimes we have a tendency to look at, look at what's going on in the world. And sometimes we think that the hand of God is not interceding or the hand of God is not on it based on what we see. But then if we flip it and realize what if no one was praying? What if no one was interceding? What if no one was going before God to uh, bind the hand of the adversary? Then what type of world would you and I be living in? And understand you all, we are living in some terrible times. But the Bible said that in the last days, perilous times would come. And so tonight, I'm really talking to, for the most, hey, Apostle Sheila, bless you, I see you. I really want to address tonight the believers tonight, because uh, today, as I was doing some, uh, some studying and some research, there were some things that really startled me uh, concerning the church. And, uh, well, let, let me give them to you. Now, you all stay for a minute and hang tight with Pastor for a minute because this is important. Because, uh, anyway, i just go ahead and give it to you. Uh, during my studies, I researched and it said, and I quote, it says 57% of regular churchgoers say they have never had an encounter with God that changed their life. Consider that. 57% of churchgoers that go regularly, their statements were they never had a real encounter with God that caused change to their lives. Watch this. More than half of all young people surveyed from the ages of 18 to 24 declared that they don't believe the Bible is relevant or God inspired the written word. That's heavy. I'll say it again. They surveyed some young folks between the ages of 18 and 24 that didn't believe the Bible was relevant. Bishop, bless you, sir. Nor did they believe that God was the one who inspired the written word of God. Let me give you some more. They said that one out of every four, that's 2.5 Americans, are done with church. All right? They are done with church. And almost half of all Americans, the count here is, watch this now, 48%. 48% of uh, Americans are done with God. Now, this is powerful. This is known as the post-Christendom era. They say that God plays no role whatsoever in their lives. This is major. All right, let me give you some more. In these groups, watch this now, in these groups, the suicide rate is astronomical as opposed to those who attend church regularly who have a relationship with God. Watch this now, the suicide rate is off the chart on those who have left God, those who don't believe God is important, or God is a factor in their lives. Now, here tonight is where I want to part tonight because all of us must understand that there is a need in our lives for the presence of Holy Spirit. Hear me. There is a major need in all of our lives. And I started the same way last uh, uh, Monday in the same way tonight. That there is a need for Holy Spirit in our lives. Listen, when I read these statistics, you all, it really, well, it kind of shocked me because 
when I read that 57% of those who go to church regularly declare that they've never had an encounter with God, it caused me to ask the question, what's really going on in our churches? Have we, we become so, how do I say it? Oh, God, I want to say it right. Have we become so attached to the emotional part of church that we never allow the Spirit of God to really get into us? Have, have, have we, thank you, Holy Spirit, have we become so acquainted with God that we have gotten used to God and then when God wants to give us an experience, an encounter with him, if you will, that we really don't open the door and allow him to come in and to, to deal with us, to deal with our pains and the integral parts of our hurts. And when it means, when, when it said 57% of regular churchgoers, that's more than Easter, Mother's Day, and Christmas and Thanksgiving. These are folks who go often. And over, listen, above half, 57%, say they've never, which, watch this now, they've come to church, but never experienced a vital, a real encounter with God. Which tells me then is that if they've never experienced God and they've been going to church and have not experienced God, it would then suggest then that either they were in the house of God and were not attentive or that there was something else going on familiar. Oh, okay. Thank you. And uh, if they're not careful, either either they are not uh, uh, listening to what's going on, or they they're in church for all the wrong reasons. And I'm sorry, but you know when I see statistics like these, I mean, it, as a pastor, as a leader, it makes me question what's really going on in the church. I know one of the things I said last night that many times people are preoccupied in church, and the devil doesn't care how he calls us to be distracted when the, when, when the word is going forth, or even in praise and worship. One of the things I often tell our church is that, is that it is imperative that we come to church not just in time for the word, but we come to church in time for worship. And here's why. Because when we are worshiping in, uh, we are in what we call praise and worship, well, that's the one thing we can give to God. The word is what God gives to us to help us live. But it is doing worship. It is doing our time of praise to God. That's the one time we can give God the very thing that he wants. And I mean, you'd be surprised that some folks, and this I've heard out of some folks' mouths, that they don't come to praise and worship because all they want is the word. And they don't feel like raising their hands and they don't feel like praising God and they don't feel like standing and they don't feel like clapping. And I'm like, dear God, you, you can just erase everything that God, that God said he wants from us. The Bible says to clap your hands, all ye people. It says, and to shout unto God with a voice of triumph. It, it says, dance before the Lord and sing a new song unto the Lord. And all these things that we do in praise and worship that God desires. And many times we come to church and now we'll come for the word. And we'll even bring our offering. But we miss the one thing that we can give to God. And listen, understand, coming to church is more than just, listen, praising and worship is more than just singing a song. But it is me giving voice to my love and admiration for God. It is me uh, opening up my mouth. The Bible says, offer unto God the fruit of our lips. And sometimes I think what we do is uh, enter and praise and worship lightly. We don't really take it, we, we take it for granted because we don't understand the significance, if you will, of what coming before God uh, with praise and worship. The Bible says to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise, which suggests then or means simply is this, that when we come before God, it says when I come into those gates, I come with a heart of thanksgiving, with thanksgiving on my lips. And into his course with praise, which means then, see, praise is not what I do in my heart. Praise is what I like to come out of my mouth, right? I come in God's house with, watch this, giving God the fruit of my lips. And so <clears throat> when I hear uh, 
uh, words like that, it kind of, uh, you know, as a pastor, it kind of make, make, make me ask the question, why do folks really come to church? Is it a formality? Is it something that we do? Or are we just trying to navigate through life without God? Y'all, please forgive me. And this is what has led me to this. One survey said eight, uh, 18 to uh, 24 year olds. Well, they don't even believe that God is relevant or the Bible is relevant. And now I, I will say this. All that falls back to uh, us as parents, because <coughs> excuse me, if our job is to train them up in the way that they should go. Then the question is, what have we been doing with our children? Have we been bringing our children to church? Or have we made church for our children an option? Have we uh, told them, well, you can do X, Y, Z or go to church? And they choose to not go to church. And we say, okay, that's cool. You don't have to go. Now, I'm going to give you an old school thing that we did when I was growing up. Thank you. Uh, uh, we didn't have an option to go to church. You know, my mother, dear God, I mean, I always say this um, as a joke, but from the time I came out the womb, gave me two, two hours and I was in church. Here's my point, is that we were raised in church. Church for us was not an option. We had to go to church, right? As a matter of fact, we didn't get to choose our church until I was 16, before I even got to choose whether or not I wanted to be at that church or not. Point was, you were going to church. If you were going to live in that house, you were going to go to church. But now, I see so many parents giving their children options to whether or not they want to go to church. And here's the problem. We find excuses why our children should not go to church. Yet, when they want to go other places that aren't going to uh, edify them spiritually, we give them leeway to do it. You know, we let them go there and listen, we don't care whether it's a school night, whether they had homework. If they want to go, we, we uh, let them go. I'll say this. My kids didn't have options. If I'm going to church, you were going to church. They were going to church. Why? Because it was my responsibility to guide their lives in a path that would be, be pleasing to God. Oh, I, I see Raphael. He knew too. Listen. He was going to church, especially since his grandmother was the pastor, the uh, Honorable E.R. Allen. And so we, we understood that we had to go to church. And this, you all, for me, creates uh, or helps me understand now why our this next generation has gotten to the way it's gotten. It's because the four parents before or after me, we decided that we we're going to give our kids options and not insist that they go to church and we want to give them rights to which they don't have. But then when they get older and get in trouble, the first place we call is the church to either build them out of jail or to pray them out of jail. You know, I often tell folks, I, I said, if someone decides they don't want to go to church and then they die, well, listen, don't bring, bring them to church for the funeral. You know, respect their right in their death to not bury them at the church. Now, you said, Pastor, that's cruel. That's not cruel. Because why should we come to church and then bury someone in the church as though they were a Christian, and then you force the preacher to almost tell a lie and put them in heaven when, in fact, they were not Christians? You see, and so what happens, here's my point. Anytime we try to navigate through life without God, anytime we want to navigate through uh, the rough seasons in life without God, we are embarking upon trouble in which the world cannot see. Listen, I've realized that if life is this tough with God, can you imagine how rough life would be without God? And this is where I want to hang my head tonight because, listen, you all, we're in a season in the Bible declared it, that one of the signs of the coming of Jesus was that there would be a great falling away from the church. And this, you all, is where we are going. Listen, not only because, uh, uh, I mean, listen, this was happening before we had all this social distancing stuff 
and happening before we had this corona stuff. This was happening in church before because people were falling away, away from God because, watch this now, because they didn't see God as relevant or necessary. And here's the part that bothered Pastor is because how can we say that we find God unnecessary when all creation testifies of who God is? When the whole creation testifies of his power, when all creation testifies of how glorious he is, yet we make a decision to not serve him or make God irrelevant. And what we're telling God is, God, I don't see you as a legitimate part of our life. And hear me, this is what I do not want to happen to those of us who are in the household of faith. Hear me now, this is what I do not want to happen to those of us who are who are believers. Because listen, it is at the point we don't see the relevance of God. It is at that point we are making a decision to live life on our own without the power of God. And watch this now. When we or if we don't have God on our side, here's my question. Where then can you turn to? Who can you turn to if you if you turn away from God? Instead of this, no one can do what God can do. No one can help us like God can help us. And if you and I decide to turn away from God, now, you know, sometimes we, we, we use excuses like, well, you know, I had church hurt or uh, the preacher did wrong. Listen, while all those things may be valid, hear me, class, and this is vital, while all those things may be valid, none of them are a good enough reason to leave God. Hear me. If you get if you're in church and experience a hurt that came from someone in church, listen, God didn't do it. Hear me. God did not do it. A person did. That was not God. A person hurt you. If a preacher, your leader, your pastor, if your pastor falls, commits some crazy kind of sin, you don't leave God over what a person does. God will respect that person's right to do whatever they choose to do. Listen, God did not shut down Jonah when he decided he wasn't going to preach. Come on, God didn't shut down David when he decided he was going to go sleep with, with, with uh, Bathsheba. God didn't shut down Samson when he decided he was going to go sleep with that girl, the other Philistine, Delilah, who got him hurt. Listen, God did not stop them. God respect their right to do what they want to do. But that is no excuse. Watch this. No reason to leave God. Hear me, class. Because I'm telling you something. Because when I, listen, this is the one part about research, that sometimes you take it personal as a leader because you realize, God, I'm, you're doing all this preaching and giving folks the word, yet people have made decisions to not live for God. Hear me. And I tell our church this all the time. I don't care what I do. If I miss God, I pray to God that I don't. But if I miss God, if I leave God tonight, and I'm not, but if I did, don't you backslide and leave God because I made a done decision. Hear me. Because here, excuse me, here is the reality. One day, all of us will have to stand before God ourselves. And listen, I promise you, you will not stand before God with me. Come on, when God judges me, he will judge me for the works that I have done. When God judges you, he'll judge you for what you've done with your life. And so tonight, this is where I want to get into this lesson because we have to then understand you all, we need the guidance and the leadership of Holy Spirit. And as, as, as I said earlier, some of us, you all, get too familiar with God. We get so familiar with God that that he's no longer a, a, a real person, that he just somebody, uh, a passing fantasy or someone we just, you know, engage with when we're in trouble. You know, some folks only pray when they, their backs are up against the wall. You know, some folks only pray when, you know, this COVID-19 came out and they thought, you know, they might get it. Dear God, they start praying. Right. But listen, let me encourage you. 
Don't ever neglect God. And Pastor Mark, you're so right. God promised that he would never leave us. And if God has promised to never leave us, why then are we trying to navigate life without God? He said, Pastor Smith, I, I, I'm a special uncle. I have love for those I remember. All right, all right. I see you, Raphael. Bless you, man. And so understand, we then cannot allow ourselves to become disconnected, right? To stop engaging with God. And it is at the point, you all, that we decide to navigate this life without the guidance or the help of Holy Spirit. I say on Monday, if he's our helper, and he's been, he's been sent by God to be our helper, then if we don't employ him, where do we go? You know, something else, something else I was reading today during my time of research that said was there was once an unwritten rule that said if you were a Christian, you could not be held as a slave. It said, therefore, slaves then were forbidden to read the Bible in order to prohibit their conversion. I'll, I'll read it again. And I quote that it was an unwritten rule that slaves were, uh, that's, that you could not own a slave if that slave was a Christian. And so what happened was, well, then slaves then were forbidden to read the Bible so that they could not make a decision for Jesus and it would prohibit their conversion. And so as time went on, without the ability to read, our people, watch this now, the only thing we knew to do was depend upon God. We couldn't read. They, wouldn't, they would not let us write. But what was passed down to us in our culture, hear me, in our history, was that even though I don't understand all the ins and outs of God, I still know, watch this now, to depend upon God. I see your mother. Mother says he's my dependable friend. And that's absolutely correct. God has proven to be our dependable friend. And watch this now. This then was the mindset that was passed down from our ancestors who were in slavery, who, who were denied the right to read or to write, but they were passed down to trust God to get them through. Now, here is my challenge with the 21st century Christian with the 21st century Christians. We have more education now. We have more access to Bibles. We, we, we can get to over 120 versions of the Bible. We know Greek. We know Hebrew. We know Aramaic. We know Latin. Yet, it is this generation had decided then that God is not relevant. Wait a minute. Now I got a problem here. You mean our ancestors knew less about God, but knew how to trust him. We have more information about God, but decide to not trust him. Something is wrong. See, I asked the question, how did God, and this is how I got to this study, to my uh, search today on the uh, internet. My question was, how did our ancestors get through slavery and get through uh, those days of rigorous labor and toil. How did they get through it? And they made it. Come on, they made it off little of nothing. They made it off the. They made it off the scraps. They survived off barely getting by. They survived off little to nothing. Yet we have everything, and we we struggled just to just to come to church on time. Come on. Now, no, I ain't throwing rocks. I ain't, I ain't throwing rocks. I'm simply using it for a scenario. We struggle to come to church and be on time for church. We struggle to read God's word. We struggle to, to, to pray. We struggle to be in the presence of God. Now, we know the church gymnastics. Come on, hear me now. We know all the church gymnastics. We know all the church lingo. Come on. Some of us can, can speak in tongue, and some of us can just speak. Come on. 
My problem is we're doing all the right things, yet we don't, yet we don't know God. See, watch this. God, God told him, God says, he says, they know my acts, but they don't know my ways. And here, family, is where the church is suffering. Okay, now it's going to be heavy tonight because I want to come down, you know, all of our role. Because the enemy in this last day, in this end time, is pulling out all the stops, right? He is pulling out all the stops to make us ignorant of his devices, right? To cause us to be unaware of what he's bringing into our life. To cause us to be unaware of the times that we're in. And hear me, if we aren't aware of the season that we're in, what we'll do is try to navigate through this life and push God out of the equation. And we will end up in a worse predicament than we were before trying to navigate life on our own. And so tonight, I want to go through some scenarios, if you will, to help us see what's going on. Because we are here, you all, in this 21st first century, and we are now a free people. But what has caused us to digress from the faith? Come on, what has caused us to digress from, from how we used to believe? Uh, we, Paul says, Paul said, we, you did run well, but what hindered you that we should not obey the truth, right? And so let me give you some scenarios. Uh, I, I, about seven of them, maybe six. I'll do five tonight, okay? I'll do five tonight and then I'll dig into it on, on Monday. Is it because God is not moving fast enough for you? Come on. Is it because we don't believe that God is moving fast enough? Oh, dear God, forgive us for making time an issue. How many of us have made time an issue with God? I recall in the scripture uh, in Genesis chapter 12 where God promised Abram. He says, I'm going to bless you. Make your name great. I'll multiply your seed upon the earth. And so God made Abram a promise at 75. But here it was now almost 25 years later. Well, I'll back up some. Almost 15 years later and the promise had not come. And here it is. Abraham and Sarah decided that they were going to help God out. Sarah told Abraham, Abraham, here's, I mean, Abram, here is what you're going to do. I got a handmaiden named Hagar. Go in there with her. Hook up with her, and you all, you all have a baby. Now, Abraham didn't back out. He didn't refuse it. Abraham went on in with Hagar, and watch this now. They developed a relationship, right? They, uh, she conceived, had Ishmael. The problem was, Ishmael was not the promised child. Ishmael was not the promise that God was trying to produce in the earth. Yet, they allowed time. Hear me now. They allowed time to move them out of the plan of God. Question. I wonder how many of us have allowed time to move us out of the plan of God. See, Whenever we allow time to be a part of the equation, what we're doing is telling God, number one, God, you aren't moving fast enough. But number two, we tell God over time, God, I don't believe that you can do it based on the time that has passed. Now, wait a minute. Here's my question. If God who holds time, who stands on the outside of time, the outside of the realm of time. If God is all powerful and he is, you mean God can't redeem the time? Consider this. Let's go back to Abraham. You know, you do, you do understand after Ishmael, I believe Sarah, well, according to historians, Sarah helped raise Ishmael until he was in his 20s or 30s. 
And then Sarah died. Now watch this. Abram, or Abraham at the time, remarried. Watch this now. And Abraham had more children. All right? And so we see here that time with God was not a factor. That God knew how to supercharge Abraham long, long after he hit 100. Come on, somebody. And so we then cannot limit God based on time. You know, we have some of our, our, our girls who, 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 who become uh, desperate because they, they think that, well, my clock is ticking. And so I got to settle for somebody. And the first person who smiles in my face, well, that's my boo. But listen, the devil generally always brings a substitute before the original shows up. Right? And we, we end up and we're stuck in a relationship, if you will, with someone, watch this, who doesn't even have a relationship with God, but out of desperation and time, we move ahead of God. And then watch this now, and then we go to God and say, God, God, bail him out. See, watch this. I realize we easily blame the devil for what's happening in our lives when the truth be told, watch this now, we were the ones who missed, who missed all the signals. Come on. We were the ones who missed all the indicators. Pastor, what are you saying? When God allowed us to see that that person wasn't the right one, when God allowed us to see their real personality, when God allowed us to see who they really were, yet we chose to override what God showed us because of our own feelings and watch this and over time. And so now down the road, Time has got us in trouble because we did not wait for the appointed time. Listen, let me help somebody out. If God promised you, listen, if God promised you anything, then time is not an issue. Woo, come on, somebody. If God promised you anything, time with God is never an issue, right? And so we can't then isolate God and use God's not moving in the right time frame as our excuse. Let's deal with, with another one. Uh, do we leave God because we have become self-serving and self-sufficient? Because we become self-serving and self-sufficient. Pastor, please make that make sense. In other words, God, I'm independent. I've learned how to do life without you. Oh, dear God, I can't tell you how many people have decided that, God, I don't need you because I'm self-existing, I'm self-serving, and self-sufficient. Watch this now with your smart self. Come on, with your smart, with your real smart self. You couldn't breathe without God. You couldn't think without God. You couldn't move without God. Watch this. You couldn't sin without God. There is nothing on this earth that you and I could carry out without God. And so there would not be any self-sufficiency if we did not have the strength <clears throat> or the breath of God. Consider this. What if God said, give me, give me back my breath? Come on. And God said, you know what? I want my breath back. Let's go here. And God said, I want all of my, my mind back that I gave you. Come on, somebody. If God, listen, if God took anything from you, you would be inadequate. If God took anything out of your life that he's given you, you would be inadequate. Yet the devil has convinced us that we are self-serving and self-sufficient. I'll prove it to you. You recall in the garden, the serpent came, and the Bible said now Eve was deceived. Okay, I'll give her that. She was deceived, but watch this. As she began to look at the fruit, the Bible says it was good to look at, to, to, to look on, right? It was good to look at. What she did was allow what she saw and how beautiful it looked to make her believe that she had to have what God said she shouldn't have. Ooh, come on. How many of us have gone after the very thing that God told us, that's a no-no. Come on. You know how it was when you were a kid? 
uh, your parents told you that stove is hot. That stove is hot. Come on. No, no. That stove. Nope, it's hot. Stay from over there. That's hot. Yet there is something inside of you that says, I don't believe it. Come on. And we have to see on our own exactly what does hot mean. And then once we get in the hot water, we pull away or ask God's help. Watch this. Many of God's children, y'all, many of God's folk are the same way. When God says, that girl there ain't good for you, leave her alone, pull away, let her go. But God, like Samson and Delilah, God, I got to have her. God, I have to have her. Come on. Here it is. Samson, he had to have this girl. Knowing he was a Nazarite. And God told them specifically, don't deal with them. Yet he had to have her. Isn't it amazing how the enemy will intensify and create a desire for the very thing God tells us not to have? And watch this. He ended up getting his eyes plucked out because he watched this. He followed a desire that was created through self-servitude and, and being self-sufficient. All right. Let me give you another one. Do we stop trusting God because we become so consumed with what's going on in the world and have begun to question God's concern. Ooh, that's a good one there. Do we stop trusting God because we become so consumed with what's going on in the world and have begun to question God's concern? That's good right there. That's good. See, watch this. Let me first say this. Never become so consumed with what's going on around you that you become distracted to what God has said. I'm going to say that again. Never become so consumed with what's going on around you that you forget what God said. Let me give you some Bible. In the book of Genesis, God told Lot to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot, take your family, your sons, their wives, your wife, and you guys get up out of there. God says, I am about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Now watch this now. Lot obeyed God. Lot was getting out of Dodge. But watch this. But Sister Lot got herself in a lot of trouble because she was so consumed with what was going on in the place where she was leaving. But the Bible said she looked back. Watch this now. I'm going someplace. How many of God's children have entertained the thought of going back or have looked back, have found themselves slipping back in places where God has told us to leave? And we find ourselves going back into those places. And now watch this. What the devil wants to do, what his desire is to do, is to, watch this, give you a hard heart, watch this now, against God, right? Give you a hard heart against God based on what's going on in the environment. Listen, if, if, if I can't change it, I, listen, I definitely don't want to go back to a system that God is not in. Come on, somebody. I, I cannot go back to a system that God is not in. Well, Pastor, okay, if God is in it, then God is not concerned. Listen, people often ask the question, where is God in all of this? And that is, listen, that is a legitimate question. Where is God in all of the turmoil, all the killing, all the violence, all the murder, all the drugs? Come on, where is God? That's a legitimate question. Here's the part we fail to see. We fail to understand that God gave the earth to men. Come on. God turned the earth over to us. We're the ones who shoot. We're the ones who kill people. We're the one who do the drugs. We're the one who do all this crazy stuff. Not God, it's us. And God, watch this. God respects the right of the person he made 
Don't forget, God made us in his image and his likeness, and God will allow what we allow. Come on. And so anytime we take matters into our own hands and tell God I into the equation, God says, fine, do you. And I'm amazed how many times people ask the question, where is God? If you recall when the towers went down, someone said, well, where was God when the towers were going down? Listen, God didn't cause those men to run those airplanes into the towers. The devil did it. Come on, how come no one is pointing the finger at the real enemy? Listen, God didn't cause your, 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 your wife to leave you or husband to leave you. That was the devil. Come on, the devil came in, caused a vision in the house, y'all divorced. That was not God. That was the hand of the enemy, right? Jesus said that the enemy has done this. Come on, God didn't kick you off that job. It was the devil, either the devil or your not being a good steward over what God gave you. Come on. And oftentimes we blame God and ask the question, where is God in all of this? Listen, God is always there. God has never left us, never forsaken us. But watch this. What men allow. You recall, I believe it is, over in Matthew 18, he says, whatever you bind. Come on. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. It's obvious then that there are some people who are not binding. And there are some who are not loosing. Now understand, you cannot be a part of the problem and then say, well, devil, I bind you. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Jesus is clear. Jesus says Satan can't cast out Satan. Let the house be divided against itself. Come on. And so it is never a matter of God's, God being concerned. God is concerned. Listen, God is not happy about the chaos going on in America or, or around the world. No. But remember now, the earth has he given to the children of men. God gave us to inherit the earth. It's our job. Here's the problem. We as human beings, we have mismanaged this planet. We have mismanaged what God has gave us authority over. Why? Because we become self-serving, self-indulging. And watch this. Jesus says we become lovers of ourselves more, watch this now, than the lovers of God. And so the problem is not did God, did God leave us or is God concerned? The question is, did we leave God? Come on. Because he says clearly, and I, I, I'm, I'm getting, getting uh, ahead of myself. But I'll show you what God says. If you return to me, he said, I'll return to you. Over in uh, Second Chronicles, he said clearly, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, we're suggesting that it is the people of God who still embrace wickedness. Now, I'm not saying we don't fall into sin sometimes. I'm not saying that, that, that we don't stumble. But we should never continue to practice the way of life, practice sin and call sin right and call living holy wrong. <clears throat> Come on. I'm amazed, you all. I'm telling you something. I'm amazed that in the season we're in, it is almost wrong. We are judged as hardened criminals to practice holiness. Come on. You are, listen, you are a laughing stock. If you practice being celibate, come on, you almost don't find don't find no virgins nowhere. I'm sorry, you want it's hard to find a virgin over 20 years old. Come on, if a man is a virgin, he's past 20, he's laughed out of the, 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 the city. If a girl is a virgin and she and she's in, in her 20s, somebody a, a girlfriend wants to know why. What you saving it for? Come on, because it's not right to save myself for the person that God has me to marry down the road. And so now that's considered wrong. But on the other hand, if you try it out, if a guy is trying out, if a guy is exploring every girl he meets, he's cool. He's labeled a player. 
you know, if a brother can try out every girl he meets, he's cool. The more I get, the more I like. You know, the better, the bigger guy I am. Right? But if a girl does it, then she's labeled a hoe. I'm sorry. She's labeled, well, yeah. She's labeled a bad girl. And so we have these, uh, 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 this unbalanced misconception of what right is and what wrong is. And we find ourselves justifying it. Listen, it is a broken system that is hooked, uh, designed by the devil to make sure we never get it right. All right, let, let, let's move on. Do we leave God because uh, we've been let down by others? That our expectation of God has diminished. Woo, y'all, that's a good one there. <coughs> Excuse me, y'all. Please forgive me tonight. Do we leave God because others have let us down? And so now our expectation of God has been, di been diminished. Listen. Okay, Lady Sarton said, calm down. She right there. See, watch this. There she go right there. Bossing me around. Talking about calm down. Okay, y'all forgive me, y'all. Okay, I'm excited tonight because the devil, the devil has got on my nerve. Okay, he has, he has suck him. He, he make, he make, make, make me itch. All right. <laughs> so okay, I'm gonna calm down. You can't leave God because other people let you down. I've realized that in life, you are going to always be let down by somebody. Hear me, in life, somebody is going to always disappoint you, all right? In life, someone you put your trust in and confidence will do something foolish to disappoint you. But here is the reality. You will also disappoint somebody else. Come on, we all been there. And so we don't leave God because someone else has disappointed us. Here is the, the reality. The Bible said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Which means then that all of us have made a mistake someplace. All of us have done something to somebody that was not right. Okay, and so I can't allow someone's disappointing of me to cause me to put God in the same category as them. You see, if you crush me and hurt my feelings, I cannot. Uh, hey, hey, Raphael, she, she said, slow down. She said, I was choking and gagging. All right. And so that, that's the part you missed. She was hiding on the corner. She told me I was talking too fast, too fast. And that's the reason I was choking. But the truth is, my science is, is dripping today. For some crazy reason today, they want to drip. And it's falling in my throat. And so, here's the reality. We cannot put God on the same standard as men. The Bible says that God isn't a man that he should lie. Or the son of man that he should repent. He said, if I said it, I will make it good. If I spoke it, I will bring it to pass. Pastor, what is God saying? God says we can't judge him on the same level or to the same degree as men. Listen, all of us have had somebody lie to us. Come on. And some of us have lied to others. Right? And so then if that's true, then I can't judge God based on someone else. Can you imagine if I were to judge God based on how many folks told me a lie? And to think that God would lie to me like them, I would never trust God. Pastor, why is that? Because there's something that God would tell me that sounds, watch this, that, that sounds unbelievable. Come on. There's something that God would tell me that I'm like, God, come on now. That, that don't even make sense. Come on. Has God ever given you, given you an instruction that, that, that didn't make sense? Come on. When God said, do it, you were like, God, come on. God, you tweaking now. I'm sorry. You didn't call it God. You said, something told me. <laughs> come on. Come on. How many folk besides pastor ever had the something told me syndrome? Come on. Something told me. 
All of us have. We've all experienced the something told me syndrome with God. But what happens is, many times when God gives us an instruction, the instruction seems too outlandish, too good to be true. <coughs> it seems impossible to come to pass. And we end up, <coughs> oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. We end up missing out on an opportunity to obey God and to follow that instruction. And so what we do is we put God in the same category as men. Listen, let me tell you something. As long as you're breathing, somebody is going to lie to you. <clears throat> okay? As long as you're breathing, somebody is not going to be forthright and honest with you. This is why God gives us what's called discernment of spirits. You ought to always pray and say, God, give me the, the, uh, the gift of discernment. Come on. God, give me this, the, uh, the gift of discernment. Why? Because what you want to do is always have the capacity to discern truth from error. The capacity to see when somebody's lying to you or someone is being forthright. And when God gives you the gift of discernment, even if you don't say anything, the Spirit of God in you will say, that's not right. He will tell you, that's error. That's not me. The Bible says to try the Spirit and see whether it be of God. Now, I know, I know you heard, try the Spirit by the Spirit. The Bible didn't say that. It said, try the Spirit and see whether it be of God. And so, when we have the or operate or function in the spirit of discernment, what that does, it says that God, I am looking to you to make sure the devil does not catch me unaware. And when the enemy comes in to attack me, the spirit of God inside of me quickens me and says, that's wrong. Come on. And he'll tell you. All right. But we must keep our ears open to him. And so I cannot then allow my expectations of God to be placed on the same level as people. Oh, dear God, I can't begin to tell you how many times, man, people that I love, people that I, I've helped, people that I've done things for, come on, people whose bills I've paid, I mean, Dick, I mean, come on, people who I, I've went out of my way to do, to do things for, who've let me down. I mean, listen, I mean, hurt me, I mean, to the core. Hurt me, said bad things. But see, this is what the Bible says. Whatever we do, in word and deed, watch this now, to do it to the glory of God. Which means then, the person I do it for may benefit, but I did it for the glory of God. Come on. Because if I did it for recognition, if I did it for, for the applause of others, if I did it to be seen of men, then God, listen, God got no glory. But if I do it to glorify God, then God is the one pleased. If I do it to bring God glory, then God is the one who received the glory. Listen, and if no one applauds me, if no one says good job, if no one says at a boy, as long as God gets the glory, if folks leave, when it's all said and done, as long as I know that I did it to please God. Listen, I recall uh, a few weeks ago when I was contemplating, you know, being through with teaching on Facebook. I said, God, listen, back then it was like on week 18. I said, Lord, this is a long ride. You know, it's wear and tear. To be honest, it, it really is. It's wear and tear. But listen, I, I do it because people are looking forward to the word of God. There are some folks, there is a remnant who still loves the word of God. And right, but, and so I question myself. I said, God, is, am I doing this out of my own ego? Am I doing it to, uh, for myself? And so I did a self-examination. And it was at the point that I told that I knew that I'm only doing it for the Lord. Listen, I don't, I don't get a dime for doing this. Come on, no one has said it. I said, Pastor, he's going to offer him for your lesson for every night. No, 
every offering sent to this ministry is given to the church. Do doesn't go to me. It all goes to the church. And so, and so, hit, hit my point <clears throat> is that whatever we do in word and in deed should be done to the glory of God. <clears throat> Excuse me, y'all. Whatever it is, it should be done to the glory of God. All right? And so as long as we do what we do for the glory of God, God, listen, God is the one who's glorified. He's the one who's magnified. Watch this. Thank you, Lillian. If it's done from the heart, when I do it from my heart, listen, because we have a heart for people and a heart for God's people especially, then if no one sees me, if no one ever notices, if no one ever comes on Facebook and says, hey, thank you, whatever, if I do it for the glory of God, then God, you all, is the one glorified. Let me get, get to my, uh, my, my fifth one, and then I'll pick up here Friday. Have we left God because we've allowed our past experiences to determine our real need for God's assistance? Have, our, have we allowed our past experiences to determine our real need for God's assistance. I'll say this. Understand. Maybe you didn't get everything you thought you should have. Maybe many of us, you know, like you. Sometimes I thought that life gave me a bad deal. You know, I could point to many things. Where I say, well, had this happened. Then this would have happened. Then here. But here is the reality. The Bible says this. Romans 8. Verse 28, it says, and we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God. Watch this now, to them that are called according to his purpose. Hear me, class. Don't allow past experiences. Don't, don't matter who brought it. Listen. Don't matter who did it to you. Number one, listen, you can't go back and change it. Okay? You can't change what's been done. Did it hurt? Yes. Yes. Was it painful? Absolutely. Did you spend days crying? Absolutely. Did it cut to the core? Yes. Those things are designed by the enemy to discourage you and to hurt you, right? Yes, so these things happen in our lives, but we can't allow these painful moments to cause us to turn away from God. And so, yes, people hurt you. I mean, come on, people walk out your life. Come on, some folks in our lives do stupid stuff. Come on, we go, dear God, why did you allow that? told you earlier, there's some things that God allows, some things God shut down. We don't always get to decide what God allows in our lives, you all. That's the reality. That's our realities. We don't always get to, to decide what God allows. But as I always say, God will allow what we allow. If you and I don't exercise our God-given authority over the devil, and bind his, his, his workings in our lives, then what we don't stop, we give permission to. See, watch this. God never told us to bind people, but he did say we could bind the enemy or the one who's behind the person's actions, right? And so I can't then allow my, the experiences of my past to determine my need for God. Listen, I realize, man, I need God more. Listen, I need God more now than I've ever needed God. Pastor Larry, why is that? Because the enemy is giving us so many more options now. I mean, dear God, you can go on Google and Google anything. You can go on Siri and find anything. You can go, on, you can find anything now. And watch this. 
There are so many things now the devil has laid up for us to distract us, to throw us off key. Watch, to get us off our place, our position in God. And so I then can't allow the junk in my life. Come on, hear the truth. The Bible said, in this life, you will have trouble. God called it tribulation, King James Version. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. He says, I'll overcome the world for you. <clears throat> and so our job as God's children is to ride the coattail of Jesus. If he's overcome, then I'm going to, listen, I'm going to ride or die with Jesus, y'all. I am. Now, th does that mean I'm perfect? No. Oh, dear God, I wish I could say I was perfect. Oh, dear God. Man, like you all, I've made so many mistakes. Oh, dear God. If I could undo some of the dumb things I've done, <clears throat> man, I'd be on Mount Rushmore. Come on, I'd be the fifth statue. But since we can't undo what's done, our job then is to move forward, right? We can't undo the hurt that people have hurt us. There's some folk who don't have the capacity to apologize, right? What if they die? They can't apologize from the grave. And so my job then, our job then, what watch this now, is to walk in forgiveness. <clears throat> yeah, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. Man, it's hard. Oh, dear God. Some of y'all are like lucky stripes. Rather fight than quit. But listen, we have to walk in forgiveness even though many times we don't want to. Why? Because Jesus said forgive. Right? He told us to forgive. And here is, you all, our reality. Many times, while we don't forgive others, sometimes, I'm sorry, most of the time, we need others to forgive us too. Come on. How many of you all needed somebody to forgive you? Come on, for your foolishness. I have. And this, you all, is what get me about, about the church folk. Many times we don't forgive others, yet when we mess up, we ask God to forgive us. Listen, we should extend the same grace to others as we ask God to forgive us. Right? And so if I want God to forgive me, I should forgive somebody else. Right? Let's give folk room to mess up. Give folk room to miss God. Because here is the reality. As long as you're breathing, you're going to always make a mistake. Come on. As long as you're breathing, you're going to always make a mistake. But if we can give folk room to miss it, come on. Don't always be, be uh, 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 what's that guy's name? The, the, uh, the uh, uh, son of the at arms. I saw you. I saw you do that. No, my job isn't to be, watch this, my job isn't, isn't to be the Facebook police. My job is to cry loud and spare not and lead folk back to Jesus. That's my job. To, to, to feed folk the word of God, give them the message of faith. Right? The message of faith. And this way, I can encourage somebody to stay with God, encourage somebody to walk in love, encourage somebody to keep their faith. And if I can do that, I've done my job. Listen, as always, I pray you all were blessed tonight by the word. Man, listen, I didn't, I didn't get nowhere near where I wanted to get. And so I'll pick up right here on Friday night at 7 o'clock. I promise to be here at 6.55 if the Lord stay the same. All right, again, I got distracted. But listen, y'all, time has flew by, man. Raphael, you're right. I'm leaning, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm learning grace. That's right. We have to all in, uh, receive the grace of God. Hear me, all of us, man, listen, all of us need the grace of God functioning in our life. Listen, man, listen, if I didn't have God's grace, I'd be, man, listen, I'd be nutty of the fruitcake. Come on. I'd be cuckoo with cocoa puffs. <laughs> Glory to God. Anyway, y'all, I'm done tonight. Let's pray. Father, tonight, thank you again for this time of your word. Father, I've given them tonight what you're giving me. And Father, as always, I pray that you would strengthen these, your people. God, you know what areas where they're weak in. 
areas they're struggling in, God, you know the hurt, the hurts, the pain, the anxiety that many God of your children feel. The letdowns, the disappointment, Father. But I pray today, like you told the Apostle Paul, you said that your grace is sufficient. And Father, tonight I pray that your sufficient grace will overshadow and overrule every situation <clears throat> in our lives. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. God, heal our hearts. Heal our minds. Heal our soulless areas. In the name of Jesus. God, heal tonight everywhere that we hurt. In Jesus' name. God, heal every wound. God, tonight heal every broken heart. In Jesus' precious name. God, for your glory. Let your name be magnified. God, prove yourself strong and mighty in the lives of these, your people. I thank you in advance. It's by faith in your son and the finished works of Calvary that I call it done. It's in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Listen, y'all, I pray that you all were blessed tonight by the word. As always, thank you all who are Continuous supporters of the ministry. God bless you all so much. Uh, those of you all who have been on every night, man, for the last 20 weeks, you all have been here. God bless all of you all. It's because of you being here. That's why we are here. Listen, can you all please help me thank Lady Sarton for allowing me to be here with you all to give you all the time I can be giving her, but to be here and giving you all the word. For the last 20 weeks, can you all please uh, give her a hand for me? All right. Do it for Pastor. Will you tonight thank her tonight for allowing me, me to be here with you all and to minister here on Facebook Live uh, uh, for you. As always, again, we pray that we have, have uh, been a blessing in your life. And as we always say, we who have the God kind of faith, we call those things which be not as though they were. And we understand and know that God has us in the palm of his hand. All right. Don't forget. Let's keep Elatory in our prayers as he goes to eulogize his grandson. Let's keep Mr. Karen in our prayers as well. Uh, don't forget Sunday school on Friday. All right. Friday at 11 o'clock. Those of you who love the word Friday morning at 11 o'clock. Please, ma'am. Please, sir. Call in to our conference call line and be a part of our Sunday school time. All right, y'all, got to go. Come on. You know how to do it. Come on. Big hugs. Love y'all. Let's go. Come on. Get it in. Mm, love y'all. All right. Here go my hustle over here. She coming she come every night like, like the devil. Always show up. <laughs> Stay here. No, stay here. Stay here. Y'all see your face? Y'all see her? Well, give us some. That's right. Behind every great man is a great woman. And and, 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 and and a cool little girl too. That's right. I decree the cut tonight. Sweet rest on you, your family, and your loved ones. God bless you all. We love you. Hey, baby. There you go. That's for you. Hey, beautiful. Hey, baby girl. Now, she over, she over cheesing now. Cause you all saying hi to her. See that? She's smiling. See that? She hiding now. She been ashamed. <laughs> all right, y'all. I gotta go. God bless you. Love y'all. Bless you.
Good night.